In this tutorial we're going to look at static electricity. The first aim is to describe the difference between conductors and insulators, then explain the behaviour of charged objects, and finally explain some applications of static electricity. Now electricity isn't something that just makes our electronic devices work. Electrical energy would first have been observed in the form of lightning in nature. Our knowledge of how to command electricity started off with our understanding of static electricity. If you think electricity is just a flow of electrons, well static means still, so it implies these electrons are for some reason still, they're not flowing. Our knowledge of static electricity actually dates back to around 600 BC, where the ancient Greeks you noticed that when you rub fir and amber, in other words fossilised tree sap, it was noticed that after this rubbing, they were attracted to each other, just like opposite poles of a magnet. In fact, archaeologists now think that ancient Romans played around with electricity as well. In certain ancient ruins, they found clay pots which had copper sticking out of them. We now know that if you get a metal and you surround it with a liquid such as an acid, you can produce a battery, and they believe that these batteries or early batteries are used to create light. Now, considering how old this technology is, it may surprise you to hear that it wasn't until 2008 that certain parts of Wales actually received mainstream electricity. Now, some people observed that when they removed clothing, little sparks were seen to fly from the clothing. In 1752, in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin carried out one of the most iconic experiments known to the world of physics. He hypothesised that the small sparks you see flying from your clothing are exactly the same stuff that makes up lightning. His job was to prove it. So he conducted a very dangerous experiment. What he did was get a kite and he basically got a silk ribbon attached to the kite which was then attached to an iron key. The iron key was attached to a conducting wire which fed into a jar of water with a conducting rod in it. We call such devices Leyden jars. Now for safety, what Benjamin Franklin did was attach another silk ribbon and then hide in a barn. This ensured that the part of the ribbon he was attached to was dry and therefore would not conduct electricity very well, keeping him safe. So what happened was when the storm arrived, the electrical bolt of lightning conducted down the kite, down through the wet silk, down through the key and into the Leyden jar. The dry silk, acting as a good insulator, prevented the charge from flowing down into Franklin's hand. Now, when Franklin waved his hand near the Leyden jar, he received an incredibly nasty shock. You see, this vessel here had stored the lightning that had basically travelled down through the kite. And when Benjamin Franklin hovered his hand near it, basically that lightning or those electrons were able to move through his hand to the earth. And that's what gave him the shock but we'll learn more about that in a bit. So the best place to start when trying to understand static electricity is to look at materials. Some materials can store electrical charge and we call these materials insulators, whereas other materials allow electrical charge to flow through them. In other words, they conduct electrical charge and we call them conductors. To understand why certain materials store and why others conduct, we have to look at their structure. We know that materials are made from atoms, and atoms have different charged particles. In other words, the nucleus of an atom has protons. Protons are positively charged, so the nuclei of all atoms has a positive charge. Whereas whizzing around the nucleus in shells are negatively charged electrons. Now, it's important to know that electrons can move, whereas protons are sort of stuck in the middle. So by rubbing such materials against others, we can actually scrape off or allow electrons to move on to such materials. Now, because the electrons are limited to orbiting around the nucleus, when electrons basically are scraped on to such objects, they can't move anywhere, so they just build up. So you get a build-up of charge on insulators. Good insulators include rubber, plastic and fabrics such as wool. Now metals also are made of atoms but there is a distinct difference. They also have positively charged nuclei. We call these charged particles cations. You might remember that word from chemistry, positively charged particles. But the difference is with electrons. In conductors, in metals, electrons are free to move throughout the structure. So if electrons hop on to conductors, they just flow through the material and they are not allowed to build up. So the key learning point here is static charge only builds up on insulating materials, never 
on conducting materials. So that is how you describe the difference between conductors and insulators. Now the principles of static electricity are actually dead easy to understand. It becomes tricky because examiners can throw lots of different unfamiliar examples at you which require you to apply the knowledge. I'm going to give you as many as I can think of that are quite popular in exams. So let's first look at how insulators actually become charged. Now if you remember I said in insulators electrons are orbiting the nucleus and they are attracted to the nucleus but you can easily overcome that force of attraction by rubbing uh, the insulator and scraping those electrons off. So if you watch this I'm basically rubbing an insulator, two insulating materials and electrons are transferring between them. Now this rod has become charged and when I hover it over paper it attracts the paper. As long as the rod is an insulator, like a plastic, you can try this at home, it's very easy. But why does this happen? Well firstly, if we look at the insulating materials before they're rubbed together, we can assume one thing, that they have no overall charge. In other words, the positive charges balance out the negative charges supplied by the electrons. So both these objects have neutral charge. Now let's rub these materials together. By rubbing, we cause electrons to transfer from one object to the other. I'm showing it from the cloth to the plastic rod, but it could quite easily be the other way around. Now, because this object has lost electrons and now has more protons than electrons, the overall charge of this cloth is positive. Whereas this object has gained electrons, so it has more negatively charged electrons than it does protons, so it gains a negative charge. Now because this has gained what this has lost, we say that both objects have gained an equal and opposite charge. In other words, they're both equally charged, but this one has a negative charge and this one has a positive charge, so they're opposite charges. Now when objects have opposite charge, they attract each other, just like the North Pole and South Pole of a magnet. However, if you held two positively charged objects near each other, they would repel each other. And likewise, two negatively charged objects will also repel each other, just like if you're holding the north poles of magnets together or the south poles of magnets next to each other. You may also remember that when you had birthday parties when you were younger, you used to get balloons, rub them against your hair, and then try and stick those balloons to the wall. Why does that happen? Well, the answer is a little bit more complicated because obviously we're not charging the wall. We don't rub the wall against anything. What we do is we normally rub the balloon against our hair. Now balloon and hair, they're both insulators. So depending which way the electrons flow, if the electrons jump to the balloon, the balloon becomes negatively charged, but if the electrons jump from the balloon to your hair, then you have a positively charged balloon. And both will stick to the wall, but for different reasons. If we move the positively charged balloon near a wall, now bearing in mind that protons can't move, they're in the nucleus, but electrons can move slightly, the positively charged balloon will attract electrons to the surface of the wall. Because the two oppositely charged objects are close to each other, they attract and the balloon sticks to the wall. However, if you move a negatively charged balloon to the wall, it will repel the electrons in the wall so they'll move away. That exposes the positive charges and once again opposites attract. Now a wall is a fixed object, but you could apply this logic to something that can move as well, like a running stream of water. You'll see, when I move my balloon near the water stream, it bends towards the balloon. For some reason, this balloon is attracting the stream of water. And you can see when I move it away, it goes, and I put it back, and it bends towards the balloon again. Now this is for exactly the same reason we're holding a negatively charged object, for example, let's say negative rather than positive, just for this example, and the electrons in the water are moving away from the balloon, leaving the protons exposed, the positive charges exposed. There is therefore a force of attraction, but because water, unlike a wall, can bend, it will move towards the balloon. However, these things can happen on a much grander scale when we look at lightning. It is exactly the same principle, though. Now a cloud is made from ice particles and water particles and all these are insulating materials. So when they rub near each other and basically scrape electrons off from other particles, we get a build-up of charge, we get a potential difference. What tends to happen is electrons build up on the lower end of the cloud, whereas the positive charges build up on the upper end of the cloud. Now I'm going to introduce a very important concept. 
all electrons ideally want to get to the Earth, where there are few electrons. So you can think of Earth a bit like an electron retirement home. It's where they want to be, ultimately. Although, do not use that phrase in an exam. That's just mine. So because there are few electrons in the ground, it has an overall positive charge. Now we're building up a huge amount of negative charge on the underside of the cloud. If we can find a suitable pathway to the Earth, for example the Eiffel Tower, which is made of metal, is an excellent conductor, then those electrons will leap to the Earth. As they leap from the cloud towards the Earth, they heat up the atmosphere so much that they cause a bolt of lightning to appear. A bolt of lightning is essentially a cloud shedding itself of its excess charge. So after a bolt of lightning has struck, basically the cloud will become neutral again, or it will become discharged. Now you may have seen these before in your science lab. This is called a Van de Graaff generator and allows you to experiment with static electricity. You can see here I'm creating bolts of lightning. Here's how a Van de Graaff works. You have a rubber band, an insulating rubber band, and at the top you have a little metal comb which scrapes off electrons as they travel up the band. These electrons move from the comb to this metal dome, giving it a negative charge. Now electrons don't like being near each other, they will repel each other, but the problem is at the moment is they have no place to go. They want to go to the Earth, but there's no available pathway to the Earth, because of course these are insulating materials. If we can hold a conducting material near this dome, these electrons will leap to that conducting material. For example, this thing here is attached to an earth wire and will offer a pathway down to the earth. This is why you see these sparks appear between the two objects as these electrons move from one object to the other down to earth. Now what's also interesting is if you put something like a doll on top of that Van de Graaff generator, it too will build up charge. You may have seen this in a lab as well when you hold on to a Van de Graaff and your hair stands on end. So you can see that each hair fibre is repelling the one next to it, so they end up being equally spaced out. They're basically filled with electrons which are trying to repel other electrons, so the only solution is just equally space yourself out from the next hair fibre. If you start hovering an earthing material near it, look, the hairs start to track it because the electrons are trying desperately to get to Earth. Another example of static electricity, which I'm sure you'd be familiar with, is when you are travelling in a car. So when you're in a car, you are wearing insulating materials and you're sitting on an insulating material, and if you're like me, you fidget a lot, basically you start to build up a charge. Electrons will move from the seat to your clothes. Or, of course, it could be the other way around, but to keep things simple, I'll choose this direction. So you're probably wearing rubber sole shoes and you're around lots of insulators, so that charge just builds up and has nowhere to go. That is until, of course, you get out of the car. Now, the first thing you do when you get out of a car is probably close the door, which is made out of metal and also happens to be very close to the earth. So those electrons will want to jump from your clothes, from your body, to the metal car door, down to earth. It's this movement of electrons that causes the electric shock you feel when you close a car door. So I've said quite a lot here, so let's just put it into a few keynotes. Rubbing insulators together results in the transfer of electrons from one object to another. Each insulating material gains an equal and opposite charge. So they're oppositely charged, one's negative and one's positive, but they're equally charged. In other words, the size of the charge is equal. Remember that opposite charges attract each other whereas materials with the same charge will repel each other. Also remember that electrons will take any available pathway to the Earth where there are few electrons. By earthing an object, it becomes discharged. So when the electrons travel down to the Earth, the object loses its negative charge and becomes discharged. And that's how you explain the behaviour of charged objects. So now let's look at some useful applications of static electricity. Believe it or not, without static electricity, you wouldn't have photocopiers. But one very easy to understand application is looking at paint sprayers. You may have noticed on the body of cars and bikes, you have a very nice, thin, even coat of paint. You don't ever get any running sort of droplets of paint because it's been applied too thickly somewhere. This is all thanks to static electricity. Here's how it works. Firstly, you connect a conducting wire to the paint can and supply it with electrons. Then you connect the bike frame to another conducting wire, but this time it takes away electrons. So you're developing a sort of circuit here. But obviously something's missing connecting the two. 
So by supplying electrons to the paint can, we make it negatively charged, including the paint inside. And by taking away electrons from the bike frame, we leave it with a positive charge. So these objects will potentially attract each other. So when the uh, paint spray can releases paint, it basically creates lots of negatively charged paint droplets, which will repel each other and spread out evenly. This creates an even mist of paint. Now the paint will be attracted to the positively charged bike frame, but this is the really clever bit. The paint will only be attracted to regions of positive charge, so at the moment the whole bike is positively charged. But as each droplet lands on the positively charged region of the bike, it discharges that region. In other words, where the paint has landed, there's no longer a charged region of the bike, so these other droplets will not be attracted to the same region. Instead, they'll be attracted to the remaining positive regions of the bike. This ensures an even coat of paint is applied. But also, it means you can spray from one direction. It can basically act like a homing missile, and from one direction you can even get the back of the bike painted. In other words, the bike frame attracts paint droplets from all directions because of its positive charge. So to recap, the bike gets a single layer of paint because once it's discharged, the paint droplets will not be attracted to the same part of the bike. The charged bike attracts paint droplets from all directions, so you can spray the paint from one direction only, but all of the bike will be covered with paint. Also, because now we have electrons flowing in one direction around this system, around this circuit, this is an example of a direct current. And that is something that does come up in exams, so be aware that this is an example of a direct current. Another very important application of our knowledge of static electricity is refueling safety. This is probably something most people don't even think about, but when fuel, which is an insulating material, travels through a filler pipe, which is also an insulating material, there are going to be electrons being transferred between them. So as the fuel's flowing, we get electrons building up in the fuel, making it very charged. So the danger is, when you move this metal nozzle with a negatively charged fuel near a conducting material such as a car chassis, these electrons will jump from the fuel to the car chassis and perhaps create a spark. Now a spark near a petrol tank is lethal, it will cause a huge explosion. So how can we avoid this? Well it's quite simple. We have a conducting wire such as a copper wire attached to this nozzle which basically allows electrons to travel to the earth. So there's never any build up of negative charge. The charges go straight to earth. So just to recap, fuel can become charged as it flows through the filler pipe. This can create a spark when near a conductor, like a metal car door. A conducting earth wire prevents the buildup of charge and therefore a lethal explosion. So that is how you explain some applications of static electricity.